Um, I think this, this, uh, this session right now is a great segue into what I'm trying to tell you, right? Because it seems that a lot of single particle people are struggling with sample preparation. So, and also, you know, continuing with uh, Dmitri's talk, you know, um, maybe you come and join the dark side and you come to tomography, in situ tomography that is, so because we don't have this problem. So, uh, a few other words on why, you know, uh, tomography is probably uh, the way to go with many things is, right? Um, if you think about where, oops, sorry, you just jumped way, way, way too far. <laughs> sorry. Um, if you uh, look at the scales of life, right? I mean, we go from anything that is, you know, angstrom size to several millimeters or meter sized, right? And uh, while, of course, a uh, single particle is great at this regime, right, there is absolutely no connection to the higher, uh, higher uh, length scales. And um, tomography, however, and cryo-electron tomography in particular, can actually bridge this gap very well. So a uh, single particle, of course, is amazing, right? And you could get great structures, you know, but, uh, you know, Apopharis and everybody loves to play with that, right? But this is something like, a, to me at least, like a boring Friday afternoon, which this literally was, you know, just to, took a few images and you're at 2.6 angstrom, okay, fine. Uh, but as soon as your sample looks a little bit more like this, right, things get hairy. And uh, in the en at the end of the day, of course, also the problem is this is not life, right? This is an isolated system, uh, which might be nice to study for many things, but what you're trying to do in the end, right, we're trying to put together the most complicated puzzle probably that there is, and that is life, right? And so how do you put Humpty Dumpty back together from something like this? And um, therefore, you know, these cellular functions that we all study, right, they come from this interplay of many, many different proteins, not just one, of course, while there is a merit in, you know, studying just one machine, I think uh, this uh, interaction of all of these machines is what is important to study and to learn about. Right? Of course, there's also a problem with uh, cellular data, and that's the following, right? It's completely crowded. If you ever looked at these images, you know, these, these good cell uh, images, you know, then you know what I mean, right? This, a cell is essentially full with stuff. There is not, it's not like you picture that there is spaces of water, you know, and ribosomes once in a while, you know, floating through. This is completely packed. And, you know, there's different types of cells that are even worse, you know. But um, there are certain things that we need to do, right, with cells that we can actually image them with cryo-ET. And this is where, you know, the holy trinity of in situ cryo-ET comes in. And that is, you know, cryo-FIP, cryo-ET, subtomogram averaging. Um, since usually my talk would be an hour, you know, I only have a third today, so I can only focus on one of these things, which will be cryofib and the sample preparation that goes into it, okay? Because I'm sure that later on, you know, and we have, you know, sorry, we have this, of course, targeting that's part of that. We have acquisition schemes and we have refinement. And I think later on, right, uh, Wim is going to talk about this, right? And you have already heard an amazing talk by Dimitri today about what you can nowadays do with room averaging, even from in situ data. And... Yes, so for me though, you know, this is the part that I want to focus on is this cryofit part, the targeting and what it actually means to look at really in situ structures and, you know, maybe not what you just think, just, you know, isolated yeast cells or something like that, but maybe there's already more that uh, can be done nowadays. Okay, so um, I think it's, it's stuck somehow. Okay, great. So let me just, you know, walk you through one of our typical projects which we recently finished and I would just like to walk you through all of the process and that you can see what this nowadays can entail. So um, about endocytosis, you know, everybody hopefully has heard about that. Just here, a, f a short recap. You know, endocytosis is a process by which cells can, you know, um, take up material from the outside, right, and get it in the inside of the cells so that they can use it for whatever, you know, they want to do with it, you know, nutrients, some other things, you know. And what's important about it is this, you know, clathrin-mediated endocytosis. And um, what you can do is this, you know, using these proteins in here, you can knock them out. And what you can do is this, you can disrupt this process. And it's also quite natural that you would think that not every attempt of the cell to make such endocytic sites will be successful. But there must be some where something goes wrong in the assembly and something goes wrong. So there must be a way of how the cell can deal with that. And, you know, cutting a long story very short, you know, this uh, I work on this with a colleague of mine, Florian Wilfling, and just 
cutting the sh story very, very short. The observation usually is this. You know, there's a biochemist and he tells you, I have this interesting observation, there's some puncta in my cells. I cannot resolve them with fluorescence microscopy, super resolution, also not giving me anything. What can we do about it, right? And this is clearly, this is one of these cases, right? We, we have these puncta that we find in the cells, which are caused by the, you know, after the knockout of certain proteins, we see this accumulation of certain proteins at the cell membrane. And we were just wondering, so what are they? At the point, um, you know, you see here that there's maybe one or two of these guys sitting there, right? So it's not that we could just cut open cells randomly and just find it everywhere, like usually people do. And you cut open some yeast cells, look at some ribosomes, and that's it. No, what you need to do, actually, you need, you know, 3D correlative FIP milling. And the point when we started this, you know, uh, most of the people in our department thought they were too small, it wouldn't work on yeast, but we tried it anyway. Okay, so here's our toolbox, 3D correlative focused iron beam milling. Um, I think uh, we saw it before, and there will also be some other talks after, but just to walk you through it very briefly. So what the focused ion beam milling does is, is we use a focused beam of gallium ions. Uh, we can draw patterns on cells using the ion beam also as an imaging modality, right? Because the gallium ions also uh, induce secondary electrons, which we can use for imaging. So we put a pattern, we shoot at it with our gallium beam, right? And we remove parts of the cell, so to thin it down. This is, you know, the real thing. So these are some cells, right, that I chose, right? And you will, if you look at this cell, we choose the cell, we start cutting, and then you see in the iron beam on this side, on the SM on the other side, how we remove material. And in the end, you know, you end up with a lamella, hopefully less than 200 nanometers. So I actually, so all of my students, you know, I make them throw out anything that's uh, thicker than 140 nanometers because they're not useful to us for, uh, for subtomogram averaging in the end. And they've gotten better with, so. So um, the workflow is as follows. So you know we use a normal vitrobot. Um, we have a grid. What we found is extremely important. I think you saw this yesterday. Um, these um, you know you can use these um, re stress relief cuts all fine. I think there's no harm in using them. But what we also found is just really using more stiff grids is really something that can help you uh, produce more reliably lamellas. And it's also very great for uh, starting students because we, you, know, you can shake them, you can almost poke them, and they will not be able to destroy those grids. Right? And they survive, and they're very important for doing, at least to me, you know, when I do these correlations, I find that this works much better than uh, just using the normal carbon ones because of the wrinkling and everything. Okay, we put our yeast cells on there. We have some uh, fluorescent uh, markers, which we can use as uh, you know, landmarks, as fiducials. And then we do, can do a correlated uh, fluorescence light microscopy and uh, correlated fluorescence microscopy in TEM. So we have two microscopes that we currently use for that. So there's the old uh, FEI core site, and we nowadays have a Leica SP8 cryo clem. So it's not this white field thing that you see here, but we have the, the um, <laughs> confocal module on it. Both, both of them work great. And what you do is, you know, you take an overview in fluorescence microscopy. You choose some grids. You know, we already pre-sort the, the squares um, that we think are you know, usable in the end. Right? You want the cells to be in the center, not somewhere you know, around the corners. Uh, we record confocal stacks, and then we correlate the squares with the SEM, and then you know, find the same squares where we took these stacks. Uh, then we have the 3D volume of our you know, uh, fluorescent data, which you can deconvolve you know, if you so wish you know, or not. Mm -hmm. Actually, deconvolved data looks amazing. Um, and then you can correlate the beads that you see here with the beads that you see over here. So here, the green ones are the fiducials that we used for the alignment. And you can see here, this is the ion beam view. So this is the view that we will be using for, for cutting those lamellas. And we can directly transfer the 3D information from here over here to, create a, to get a prediction of where we should be cutting the lamellas. And um, you know, another big business that's now coming up is for this. Um, we could be doing this all manually. And, and as a matter of fact, we've been doing this for some years now that we've you know, made this transfer, draw in the pattern, you know, because this is happening on a separate PC. So you need to find some landmarks again, draw it in. Still, success rate pretty good, you know, 75%, not bad. But we can definitely do better. And yesterday also, you know, the trend for many, many of these uh, things is that you try to do automation. And, you know, and also FIP automation is a big thing. I think you've all probably seen um, the papers from the Pillowfer Lab and uh, Alex DeMarco, right, for the, for the automation. But there's also other automations, right, that are now also available, right? There is this uh, option of AutoTEM uh, on the FEI scopes, for example, right? And there's also AutoScript, I think, that, that probably Alex used. And um, 
what uh, what I like, you know, in in our field is right that there is always this option that you can go for a user inspired and also you know from the users for the users type of software, kind of like Serially M is right. And we are fortunate enough that we have a very talented uh, PhD student in our uh, department who is working on using just AutoScript and building on top of that an automation software, you know, including the the GUI and everything, right? And just to show you. Uh, that this, you know, this has all the things that you want. You know, can do the trench milling. You can do the, you, you can do all of these things, right? And this is quite easy, uh, as it turns out. Um, and what's important more for us, at least, at least, what's very important for me is now that we can actually load these correlated images, and we can use cross correlation. Right? Because if you picture it, you do your, you know, your alignment. You know, with your fiducial markers, there's some time. There's a little bit of drift on the scope, and at some point, you know, your image will be slightly different, which makes it very hard then to find exactly that spot where you need to cut your lamella. And this will actually allow, this will do that for you. So you just then cross correlate again with the previous image. It will find exactly the same spot, put your pattern where it's supposed to be, and then you start your milling process. And I think this is the, the video that he gave me uh, where you can see how this is done. Uh, we don't need it to do it for that long. Um, there's a few words to be said, and I, uh, the, uh, while this is playing, I want to just point out a few of them. What I just find, for me personally, is the best option is actually I let the automation do everything but the final, final, fine milling in the end, both for you know, our software and the auto TM, for example, because in the end, you know, I don't need 200 nanometer lamellas. I need maybe 150 and below, right, 140 and below. And this is then still, in my opinion, best done manually, but you know, hopefully soon we'll also have solutions that regularly will give you that. Okay. So once you have our lamellas, right, where we found this spot again, we can then actually go to the TEM, and we can again use uh, the fluorescence image here. And this is a TEM overview of the same grid. We actually do see those beads, which we had before again in the TEM. So we can do the same spiel again, you know, uh, and correlate those points again. And we get a prediction of where we should look for the sites that we're interested in. Zooming in yet more, you know, uh, here you see that again, the, the lamella, you know, it survived. You can also go for the more traditional uh, cryo clam view, and you see that in this case, right, there were three sites uh, that potentially um, should be interesting to us, and you see actually the accuracy is quite neat. And so we took these two tomograms, and what in this case we found, and you see it over here, there's this bulge already at the uh, cell wall and the cell membrane, and you see this very weird-looking structures, you know, some ER wrapping around like an almost empty, you know, void area, <laughs> and then you know. Again, today not enough time to go into all of the details of subtomogram averaging and, um, and template matching, but you know, you can then find ribosomes, you know, find membranes. You can you know figure out which ones are associated to the membranes. And what in this case we found is that we have this area of apparently you know some diffuse protein density that the ER likes to wrap around. Um, there's ribosomes around, and we know this is, is ER because there's ribosomes still attached, you know, to this ER. And then what's also happening, and we see that in the video, hopefully it will play, uh, what is super interesting is that, um, so this is the tomogram, and you will see it in a second, that these openings in here, you know, you see this is the amorphous protein density and in the, these openings. Um, and as it turns out, these openings are actually so big that ribosomes should readily be able to go in and out, but they don't. And we never find ribosomes attached to the inside of these membranes. So what we most likely have is some kind of liquid phase separation of these proteins. You know, we can, you know, these are these proteins that are involved in this endocytic process. And what we just found, therefore, and you know, what we are able to correlate is like these events that happen maybe twice per cell, you know, 500 nanometers or something like that in size, and uh, completely devoid of any other cellular <laughs> constituents. You know, and this is just um, um, a very interesting um, finding in that sense, right? That apparently there is a way how the cells can buffer these proteins when something goes wrong with endocytosis and then afterwards they can de either deal with it or maybe reuse them because they actually, you know, just exchange with the cytosolic, uh, with the cytosol. And you see it in a second. See, there's all of these openings and the ribosomes could go back and forth, but, you know, for some reason they don't and this is what we're currently looking into. Okay, so, uh, as I pointed out in the very beginning, you know, this is all nice and neat that you can do this in isolated cells. But of course, um, again, life is maybe more complex than, or a lot of life is more complex than just single cells. And therefore what we need is, you know, apart from this targeting, we need ways, you know, to really look at native cells. And, you know, uh, I want to just tell you one story that we worked on. Um, 
which is this here, you know, um, Bienchen und Blümchen, you know, it will be exactly that, you know, of, I think in English it's like of birds and bees or something like that. And uh, if you never thought about it, you know, these flowering plants um, are actually the main source of our food, completely, right? And therefore it's quite interesting actually how they procreate in a way. Because what happens is, um, so if you look at a flower, you know, you know, either through a bee or wind or something like this, a pollen grain lands on the stigma here. Um, the environment that's created there by uh, the flower, you know, essentially sugars and other things, causes them to grow these tubes. Within a couple of hours, they grow for millimeters, right, to reach the egg cells inside of the flower. And the, the, the question is you now, how do they actually do that, right? Because this is a single cell, the pollen is a single cell, and it's able to grow several millimeters in just a couple of hours. And this is what we want to look at, you know, obviously what you probably need for something like this, you know, because it's pretty big, it's high pressure freezing. And then we want to do lift out, as we pointed out already, so that we can do 3D correlated fit milling or something like this, and then go into data processing, you know, and, and, and acquisition. So lift out. Um, right, I mean, it's a, quite a, 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 let's say, a simple question, right? How do we go from bulk material uh, to this fit milling, right? So it's... Um, and two approaches have been proposed you know, before and you know, significantly came from the department of Wolfgang Baumeister. You know? And one of them, you know, both of them entail first, you, know, re you need to remove some of the material. So you have some slab that you can work with. And then there is one way, you know, this is the recently published uh, cryogripper approach, you know, um, where you just have a tiny gripper, a nanoscopic gripper, where you, you know, take your lamella or like your chunk, take it somewhere else, place it somewhere, and then you can you know, mill it down. You're happy, and you know. Then there's the other option using a needle, uh, the easy lift system, right? Where basically you just weld a needle uh, to that slab, cut it, and then also do your fine milling. If this somehow looks familiar to you, you know, this is that. Um, yes. So what we needed here is actually some um, significant hardware changes, because these things um, were done on an old quanta, right? And the biggest difference there definitely is the eucentric height, so where you can actually work with this. So on the ocular system, on the modern ocular system, the issue is we lost uh, 2.8 millimeters of working distance, essentially. And um, therefore, we need to adapt you know, this cryogripper from Kleindijk um, to the geometry that's in there. But again, you know, if you have talented uh, PhD students who then also can operate it, you know, operate with a PlayStation controller. In fact, this is how you operate this, this guy. Um, what you need to do is, you know, we looked at the design, and this is just a 3D rendering. Um, but the problem is on an Aquilos, right, you have these little horns that open uh, the shuttle for you. And these get completely in the way for you to do the lift out. So, you know, what you could do is redesign a shuttle, build a new shuttle. Uh, something more radical is just this, you know, you open this thing up, you get a nail file, and you remove enough material. I hope no service engineers of FEI are here today. So we can just remove this material, right? And so that you make it accessible again. And what, then, what that allowed us to do is this, to look directly at those grids that had these pollen tubes on it. And you see here these gigantic tubes. This is a single one that goes from one side of the grid to the other. And um, what's nice is what we're mostly interested in is this tip region. Um, and then what you can do is, you know, you look down on it with the iron beam. So you rotate your grid look down on it, you, you know, cut a little uh, handle so you can grab it, grab it. You come with the uh, nano gripper, you see it here in both iron beam and SEM. And then this is the video of you just take it, bring it somewhere else, put it down on a clean grid, you weld it in with some GIS, you know, and that's it. And then, you know, after you have it there, you know, you can cut several lamellas, you know, in this tip region and here, and then you, you take your tomograms, which I think is a, Still, I don't want to make it sound like it's a routine process in that sense, right? But it is definitely something that is, you know, I was really amazed, you know, um, Sven, you know, if, I don't know, if maybe he played with PlayStation before, I don't know, he has a much better gift of, you know, picturing things in 3D than I can. Uh, he just does it, which is amazing to me. But those things do work, right? It's just many things that now still need to be worked out, which is, for example, how, where do you place these, uh, you know, the things that you lift out? And you've seen it in the paper from Miroslav, for example, these, these, um, these, half, these slot grids that they use, you know, to put something in. Uh, it's a very complicated process. So maybe, you know, also with feedback from the community, maybe we can come up with something that's more 
amenable to routine application, right? And we think, for example, that just using plain grids and being able to just glue it onto these plain grids is one way uh, how this could be done. Okay, second option, uh, the, the easy lift system. And what there you do is just you have your sample, you have your needle, you weld on the needle with the GIS, and this is then you know one of the problems that you get into, which is because as you go, right, you get more and more GIS on your sample and your needle, so you need to either clean it or at some point even replace the needle, which is not, actually not too bad a procedure, but it, you need to stop working for that, you know, vent the system and everything. But anyways, it works quite well. It's very straightforward. You know, and then another option how you can attach these things, what we did is we just used the normal uh, um, half grids and then on these pins that they have, we just welded them on there just by redeposition, right? You mill the, the half grid and the redeposited material is attached here. And that's how then you end up with, with a you know, chunk that's attached to your half grid. Uh, even uh, brought it home in this way. Uh, you cut the lamellas, you get thin lamellas. And again, you end up with a nice tomogram. And what you see here already is the reason why we're after these tip regions. You see that these are completely full with these vesicles, you know, that are co have also a protein coat. And what, of course, they are there for is that as these, these uh, tubes are growing, they need to constantly endocytose material, right, to bring in nutrients and other things so that they can grow. And at the same time, they also need to exocytose to bring new membrane components and other things so that these tubes can actually grow this fast. Now we're just looking into the details of their composition of this, and this is done with um, <coughs> Li Wenjiang uh, at CUHK in Hong Kong. Okay, so finally, you know, this trinity of, you know, cryoT, cryofib, and subterminal averaging. You've seen today already you can get higher resolution, and I hope that I was able to show you that you can also use it to look at things that might be happening only once per cell, and also maybe not only in individual cells, but we're now at the point where we can start really working with tissue. It will take some more time to optimize, but this is really the point where we can go now into this. Okay, in the end, just a few words of thank you, uh, first and foremost, to Jürgen, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but he says hello to everybody who knows him, and uh, who's giving me all of this freedom uh, to work with. And my collaborators, a big thanks goes to my students, you know, who do many, many crazy things that I come up with, right? Uh, and my colleagues, Ben Engel, and especially also William, uh, for providing us with the software stopgap that we use. Um, and of course you, and if you have any questions, Please ask. Thank you very much, Philip, for a great talk. So we switch to questions. Mm. You mean that there is more uh, contamination afterwards? No. Yes. no. So uh, actually, our, so we regularly, I try to do it on a monthly basis. Sometimes it happens that you know it takes like three months. We monitor the redeposition and the ice contamination rate on our uh, on our FIPS. Um, like I said, like monthly or you know, every couple of months. On the Arcelos, it's currently like at 25 nanometers per hour, which is fine. Um, I think before they measured it at some point, I think it just fluctuates too much. I think initially it was just barely below the specs. But now it's um, actually fine. So nothing definitely. I was wondering uh, about the results. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, um, and how precise is it to deliver it on the surface of the grid, and how is that prepared beforehand? So, so that is a, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, this is, for example, also where the silicon oxide grids come into play again. Uh, they're much more stiff than just the carbon ones. So with the carbon ones, definitely what happens is you go there. I mean, you do see some kind of a shadow but it's very hard to find the right point. And if you just, just touch it, you just, you just break through, yeah. right? So we could look into ways, you know, using these, I think they have these um, extra coated grids as well that are supposedly more stiff. Uh, also maybe going for something that's, you know, even thicker or more stiff, right? Because we don't care in that sense. Uh, yeah, but silicon is already working. Yes, so it, it works better definitely, but we need maybe something that's a little bit more, I don't know, stable or something like this. So actually, most of the time, it just sticks there on its own. And you use some GIS to you know, really glue it in. But of course, this is now something that we're looking into right now, is how to pre-treat the grid with compounds that allow us to you know, just really stick it there and then let go and then maybe coat with a little bit more and then have it on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, actually, they, they love it. Hmm? They love it. They love it. Yeah, so um, one of the most complicated system or complicated cells that I usually work with. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, uh, probably you could also try that. It's just that, um, um, I, so the most complicated cells I usually work with is neurons. And, you know, it's very difficult to get them to grow happily and so on, right? But the silicon oxide with some laminin coating is like, everything's fine. I think also HeLa, you need to optimize a little bit with the coating. They definitely do behave differently on carbon than they do on silicon oxide. For example, with healers, we observe that we just put them on plain uh, silicon oxide. They're more round, right? They're not so as happy, they're not as spread out. And then you do some, um, some coating, right? And they become as flat as they are on, on any other uh, grid type that you use. Really. Yeah, so um, you could do it, and initially we have, but uh, at this point I'm quite convinced that they are good, and to me the risk of contaminating them in the, in the uh, fluorescent microscope is just too high. I don't want to waste them. Yeah. Can I just follow this question? Yeah. Do you see devitrification? Um, in this case, when uh, you insert lamella into cryofluorescent microscope, <coughs> after imaging? So, no, actually they do survive that. The problem is usually that you get these typical chunks of ice and those things on <coughs> top, not the vitrificate. At least I have not observed any. But it's always hard to know, right? Because you never know, did this happen before? Did this happen afterwards? Uh, since after you put them in the TM, it's not worth putting it in the, in the fluorescent microscope anymore because you killed the fluorescence. Um, we never went back in that sense just to check if, if it got worse or something like that, so. Mm -hmm. So at the surface where we FIP, not necessarily, but there is definitely, I would say that if you have material that's super sensitive, so for example, we have these you know, um, cells that have like lots of starch, and if you're not very careful of how you do it, you immediately see the beam damage then in the TM. So I would say it's not 100% innocent, but probably mostly innocent that, uh, you know, you need to be careful, you need to know what you're doing, and of course if you see that, you know, this is a part that I'm not going to, you're not, not going to use this lamella and you move on. Yeah, but it could be intrinsic to the milling, I mean, because yeah. the big chunk that is removed is yeah. really with uh, higher energy yeah. also, and then you reduce it yeah. to thin it, but then still the interface might be affected more on the Exactly, that's, the probably there is a very thin layer, I would think, right, because we also know that, you know, some of the gallium is probably also being deposited in it, so some energy is probably ending up there. So as to how thick that layer really is, I mean, it's never so significant that you could see it in the tomogram that there is really like a layer. I never saw anything like that. Probably it's, there must be something like that in my opinion, but it's probably so thin that you don't observe it in that sense, right? And even for, the, for those big chunks, right, I mean, you only mill those big chunks at, the, at their surface, and that surface never makes it into the thin lamella, right, in the end. So you would never see those areas that have been, you know, cut with one nanoamp or something like that. You never have that in there. It's actually more of an issue if your cryogripper or your needle is not 100% cool and, you know, you touch it. And even that, that, that compression in that sense, where that is more of a concern to me as to how strongly I press mm -hmm. it, right? And that is more of a concern. Therefore, you need to be a little bit careful when you do that. And then definitely you do see, in my opinion, artifact. But you need to be careful about that. Do you have more questions? No. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you.